Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining us once again. The subject of today's episode is none other than Mexican Mafia legend, Joe Morgan. He quickly rose to the top and became a carnal con la palabra pesada and was seen as first amongst equals. But before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We'll begin today's episode with Morgan's family's origin. You are viewing naturalization paperwork for Morgan's father, George Morgan. According to the document, his father was born on March 8, 1895 in a town in Austria whose name I cannot pronounce. Does this mean that Morgan's father was Austrian and not Croatian? No. I researched the town, and it is indeed part of the present-day Croatia. Then what explains the reference to Austria? When Morgan's father was born, the town was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But after World War I, when the empire was broken up, this land was ceded to the new kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, a.k.a. Yugoslavia. When Yugoslavia broke up, Croatia became an independent nation, including the land of Morgan's father's birthplace. If we look on the back of the document, we can see that Morgan's father swears an oath renouncing his allegiance and fidelity to Alexander I, the king of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Below that, you can see the father's original name and his adoption of the American name, George J. Morgan. A certificate of naturalization was issued to Morgan's father on September the 20th, 1928. Now let's turn to Morgan's mother, Clara Morgan, and her petition for naturalization. The document lists her birthplace as Vis, Yugoslavia, and birth date as March 8, 1900. The petition also lists Miss Morgan's race as Dalmatian. Does this mean that Miss Morgan was not Croatian? No. Vis is an island off the Dalmatian coast in the Adriatic Sea. Dalmatia is one of the four historic regions of Croatia. Moreover, both the land of Morgan's father and mother's birthplace has been inhabited by the Croatians since the 6th century AD. Dalmatia was a province in the Austrian Empire known as the Kingdom of Dalmatia. After World War I, Dalmatia was split between Yugoslavia and Italy. After World War II, the entirety of Dalmatia came under Yugoslavia's control. When Yugoslavia broke up, it became part of the nation of Croatia. On the back of the document, we can see that Miss Morgan takes an oath, like her husband before her, and renounces her allegiance and fidelity to Peter II, King of Yugoslavia. Morgan's mother's petition for naturalization was granted on February 25, 1938. On September 19, 1945, Mr. Jose Rojo, age 52, disappeared. His sister Ramona Rojo traveled to Los Angeles from Mexico in December of 1945 because she was concerned for her brother's safety since he had not responded to any of her letters. Ramona testified in a pretrial hearing that when she confronted Mr. Rojo's wife, Elvira, she was very nervous and trembling. Ramona also testified that Joe Morgan was living in the home, and when she asked him about Mr. Rojo's whereabout, he simply shrugged his shoulders. As Ramona left the stand, she glared at Elvira, who smiled and said, She never liked me. Due to the insistence of Ramona and her brother Alphonse, an investigation was launched. It should be noted that the family reported Mr. Rojo missing, not his wife, Miss Elvira Rojo. Law enforcement arrested Joe Morgan and Elvira Rojo on February 19, 1946, due to the suspicious circumstances regarding the disappearance of Mr. Rojo. The initial investigation was closed when law enforcement officials were satisfied that the pair were not responsible for Mr. Rojo's disappearance. Morgan was not freed, however, as he was being held for violating his probation and was awaiting the juvenile court to take action. Miss Rojo was released. However, Mr. Rojo came from an important family in Chihuahua, Mexico. Through the Mexican consulate, they put pressure on law enforcement to reopen the investigation, which they promptly did. They searched Rojo's home once again and found a human tooth in the incinerator. Before they could question Morgan, he escaped on February 27, 1946. Morgan escaped by assuming the identity of William R. Westbrook, age 16, who was due to be transferred to a county forestry camp to serve his county jail sentence. Deputy Probation Officer John Snyder placed Morgan into his vehicle uncuffed. And at Colorado Street in San Fernando in Glendale, California, Morgan jumped from the vehicle shouting out, I'll be seeing you to the surprise Snyder. 
William Westbrook later told officials that when Morgan arrived at the county jail, Morgan announced to everyone that he would be Westbrook's cellmate. Westbrook said that Morgan repeatedly practiced signing his signature and studying his mannerisms. He also said that Morgan threatened him with a gang beating if he failed to go along with the escape plan. Even at this early age, Morgan already had a history of escapes from custody. On October 11, 1944, he escaped from a juvenile officer after he was picked up on a missing juvenile report. Morgan was captured and charged with Grand Theft Auto on October 24, 1944. On November 10, 1944, while Morgan was being transported from one forested camp to another, he escaped again and was captured two weeks later. Morgan served several months in the forestry camp and was released and placed on probation. March 7, 1946, detectives received a tip that Morgan was seen in an East Los Angeles neighborhood near a wrecking yard carrying a bottle of milk. Officials immediately began to search for Morgan. They observed a half-empty bottle of milk in front of a wrecking yard located on 126 North Ford Boulevard, and they surrounded the location waiting to see if Morgan exited or returned to the spot. When Morgan attempted to leave, Deputy Ernie Silvis yelled out, Halt! Morgan refused to comply, and Silvis shot Morgan in the right leg with his 38 caliber service weapon. It makes sense that the address Morgan was located at is on Ford Boulevard in East Los Angeles, since Morgan is known to have ties to the Ford Maravilla gang. Morgan was interviewed in the prison ward of the General Hospital after his arrest. Here he is lying in the hospital being examined. The caption of the picture reads, Doctor examines Joe Morgan, recaptured with his shot. This is a fine way to start a life, said the 16-year-old. When Morgan was asked if he would escape again, he replied, I've had enough of all this. This is the wound that would lead to the eventual amputation of a portion of his leg. On April the 3rd, 1946, Morgan confessed to the murder of Mr. Jose Rojo. Sheriff Eugene Biscalus is seen here taking down Morgan's confession in the prison ward of the General Hospital. Interesting fun fact, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Training Center is named after Mr. Biscalus and is officially known at the, as the Biscalus Center Training Academy. Morgan said he killed Mr. Rojo in a fight that erupted when Mr. Rojo got angry because Morgan was wearing one of Mrs. Rojo's rings. According to the statement, Morgan said Mr. Rojo pulled out a knife and attempted to kill him, but Morgan said he defended himself by hitting Mr. Rojo with a tire hammer over the head. He then wrapped the body in a blanket and threw it down a steep hillside. Miss Rojo was present during Morgan's confession, and according to newspaper accounts, she shouted hysterically, Don't believe him, it's a pack of lies. After the confession, Morgan led sheriff's officers to the remains of Mr. Rojo one half mile above Seminole Hot Springs near Calabasas. Morgan told investigators that he came to know the area when he was working in a forestry camp chain gang. Miss Rojo was brought along to identify the remains, but appeared to be too traumatized by the situation. So Morgan identified the remains instead. Bits of clothing and a handkerchief with a distinguishable laundry mark were also found. In this picture, you can see the officers holding up Mr. Rojo's skull and other remains for the newspaper camera. If you were paying close attention, you will remember that one of the officers mentioned in the caption of this photo was the same person who shot Joe Morgan in the right leg when he was captured on March 7, 1946. That's right, it was Deputy Ernie Silvis. His face is barely visible in the center of the photograph. Upon their return to the Los Angeles jail, Miss Rojo was arrested and booked for the murder of her husband, Mr. Jose Rojo. On April the 4th, 1946, Morgan was questioned by District Attorney's investigator Chester S. Sharp and John H. Morell of the Sheriff's Office. Morgan told the men that Miss Rojo had nothing to do with the crime or the disposal of the body, but that she knew all about it because she saw him do it. It appears that Morgan was attempting to clear Miss Rojo of criminal liability. Miss Rojo, on her part, said she lived in fear of Morgan and didn't come forward because he threatened to kill her and her two children. On May 9, 1946, Morgan shocked those assembled in the courtroom for a pretrial hearing when he pled guilty to the murder of Jose Rojo and changed his story once again. Morgan testified that he murdered Mr. Rojo at the insistence of Miss Rojo so they could be together. Newspaper accounts recorded that Morgan was still in a wheelchair two months after suffering a bullet wound during his capture on March 7, 1946. This did not bode well for his leg. 
On July the 23rd, 1946, Morgan was sentenced to five years to life on a single count of second-degree murder instead of first-degree murder because the judge believed Miss Rojo was the true culprit behind the murder of her husband. Superior Court Judge William R. McKay stated, She made love to this boy and then persuaded him to kill her husband. I feel he deserves some consideration for helping to convict her. Miss Rojo was convicted for second-degree murder and sentenced to five years to life, the same as Morgan. On September the 13th, 1946, Miss Rojo was shipped off to the women's prison in Tehachapi, California. On July 30th, 1946, Joel Morgan arrived at San Quentin Prison. During this time, San Quentin was the reception center for the California Department of Corrections. All the fresh fish passed through San Quentin and were issued their prison number and either remained and served their time there or were sent to other facilities to serve their time. San Quentin documented the new arrivals in their prisoner logbook. Joel Morgan was assigned prisoner number A4242, arrived July 30, 1946, name recorded as Joseph Morgan, Nativity, California, crime murder in the second degree, term of years five to life, court and county, Los Angeles, occupation student, height 5 feet 11 and a half inches tall, weight 155 pounds, eyes brown, hair dark brown, age 17, Years of schooling 10, marital status single, religion Catholic, birthday April the 10th, 1929, and sentencing judge W.R. McKay. Joe Morgan's entry in the San Quentin Prisoner Logbook also contains his housing assignment. If you look below the main entry, you will see that CDC transferred him to Lancaster December the 3rd, 1946. But what was in Lancaster? To answer that, we must quickly cover the origins of DVI. Dual Vocational Institution. DVI began as CVI, the California Vocational Institution. In 1945, State Senator Charles Hastings Duell authored legislation to establish the California Vocational Institution at War Eagle Field in Lancaster, California. War Eagle Field was used to train British pilots during World War II beginning in 1941, and when the United States entered the war, we began using the field as well. Once the war concluded, the field was closed and declared surplus. Construction began on a permanent facility in 1950, and it was completed on July 6, 1953. The new facility would be renamed in honor of State Senator Charles Hastings Duell, who passed away in 1947. The first inmates were received on July 20, 1953. DBI was designated to house the most incorrigible CYA wards between the ages of 18 and 25 and teach them a trade. In 1952, Mexican Mafia and Aryan Brotherhood associate Edward Bunker spent time at the Lancaster facility and he recorded it in his autobiography, Education of a Felon. Please allow me to read you a small portion. The superintendent of the Preston School of Industry threatened to quit if I was returned to his institution, or so I was told by the man who drove me from the L.A. County Jail to the prison for youthful offenders in the town of Lancaster. It was on the edge of the vast Mojave Desert, but still in the county of Los Angeles. Built during World War II as a training base for Canadian flyers, it was now operated by the California Department of Correction. They'd built a double fence topped with rolled barbed wire around the buildings. Every hundred yards was a gun tower on stilts, presto, a prison. The convicts of Lancaster were between 18 and 25, 90% of those being between 18 and 21. On August 26, 1948, at the age of 19, Morgan was received at Folsom Prison. Four days after that, on August 30, 1948, he was transferred to San Quentin Prison. After 14 months at San Quentin, Morgan was transferred back to Folsom on November 1, 1949. Sometime after this, as the California Department continued to grow and evolve, the use of the prisoner logbook was discontinued. This episode is getting a little long, so we'll have to pick up Morgan's story in another episode. But for now, good night and God bless.